It's, it's a curious subject, the whole subject of scale, because no one really teaches it. Why a hundred years? Why not a thousand or a million or whatever? What determines that? Where, where is it? You think of a line as one dimensional, a surface as two dimensional, and you know, a cube say as three dimensional. But these objects have, could have 3.2 dimensions. The dimensionality is always opening up. It's getting bigger and bigger. It was sort of staring people in the face. There's this extraordinary commonality not just all the physiological variables of mammals, so did insects and fish and birds and plants. All of these variables, all of these characteristics, when you plot them just on straight lines, which is kind of extraordinary. However, the mathematics gives rise to a real challenge. Yes, you can avoid collapse and have open-ended growth, but you, you pay a price. And the price is that the pace of life gets faster and faster. Are we running out of the ability to adapt fast enough to our own innovations? We have a pretty good understanding of how our physical world works. We understand the earth revolves around the sun. We know gravity and friction exist. And all of this is explained in quantifiable and predictable formulas. But while the world of physics is neat and tidy, the world of biology is messy and full of unknowns. Why do humans stop growing when they become adults? Why are our lifespans 80 years, while for many other animals, it's a fraction as long? Why are city streets, blood vessels, and trees all built with the same branching structure? Jeffrey West is a theoretical physicist who answers all these questions by explaining that there are, in fact, universal principles and scaling laws that can explain and predict everything from the heart rate of living organisms to the infrastructure requirements of cities and much more. In today's discussion, we explore his book, Scale, which examines all these scaling laws in detail. Hope you enjoy the show. Jeffrey, welcome to the show and thank you for taking the time to chat with me today. Um, I have a lot of questions about your book, Scale. I have uh, read it and Honestly, every time I got through three or four pages, I'd have to stop and think about the ramifications of what you just said and and how how many times I have had my mind blown reading the book. It's it's kind of absurd. Um, but before we get into the actual details of the book, I want to I want to help listeners understand your background and where you're coming from here. So you are a physicist, but your book covers a lot of ground. It includes biology, networks, cities much more. Can you walk me through your background and explain what led you to become interested in the scaling of these cross-disciplinary systems? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Kevin, for inviting me. Delighted to uh, participate and look forward to our conversation. Um, yeah, so um, as you say, um, I'm a physicist. I'm a theoretical physicist. And uh, I think uh, even since early childhood, in a kind of semi-conscious way, I've always been interested in, you know, how do things work? Why, why are things the way they are? You know, it's standard things a kid often is interested in. And somehow that stayed with me. Uh, and that's why I eventually ended up um, in physics. Well, there were two reasons. One was I had to be pretty good at mathematics, which was needed. Uh, but also because um, it, it seemed to be, you know, it seemed to address problems in a very profound way, namely, well, something that caught my imagination, namely such thing that, that not just in a principled way, which was very important, but in a quantitative way, and, and therefore uh, in a predictive way. And uh, that combination of characteristics has stayed with me throughout my career. Um, but um, I, so I got very interested um, once I had uh, you know, got my degrees um, or during my PhD, certainly in sort of the big questions in physics, you know, the basic laws, what are the basic laws of nature, you know, the fundamental particles and the implications of those, especially later for questions of the origins of the universe and all those wonderful questions. And um, uh, for the first, 
I don't know, 25, 30 years of my career, those were the questions I was primarily interested in. But um, along with that, from the very beginning, uh, beginning meaning through high school and into college, I sort of had a romantic image of what academia and scholarship and research was about, that it was sort of this community of scholars interested in all the various big questions, not just the ones I mentioned, but you know the origins of life, the origins of social behavior, um, the meaning of life, you know, all these kind of sophomoric kind of questions. Um, and I sort of had this romantic image, which I knew was unreal, that that's what you would be doing if you went into academia. And of course, it's to some extent, I wouldn't say quite, I was going to say quite the opposite. That's too strong. But it's not like that. In fact, especially now, um, you know, the, 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 the forces at work, the reward forces of tenure and promotion and acknowledgement and so on, all strongly make people focus on one individual problem within one individual, I was going to say discipline, but sub-discipline or even a sub-sub-discipline. So, and um, the idea of thinking about these big questions um, gets at, at best swept under the rug and often just thrown down a deep hole and never thought of again. Um, uh, and typically that's not how you're going to get promotion and get uh, acknowledged and so forth. Uh, and that was very disappointing to me. <clears throat> the physics still held out that possibility and I guess encapsulated in the somewhat ridiculous uh, notion of a theory of everything. Uh, when, when string theory raised its head in the sort of late 80s, 90s and still going. Um, some of, but but it wasn't a theory. Of course, it's a ridiculous statement. It's ridiculous, a theory of everything. Um, especially with, I mean, what a physicist meant by a theory of everything was the fundamental forces of nature. But in fact, you know, everything involves what I'm looking at now. I'm looking across the Rio Grande Valley and there's trees and plants and houses and mountains and snow and all the rest. Those equations don't tell you anything about that. So, and that's what I was interested in, in sort of how do you connect all of these things? So that's that stayed with me, even though I was a canonical high energy theorist, meaning I was interested in these fundamental questions, quarks and gluons, string theory, dark matter, and so on. Um, but uh, during the 90s, um, uh, several things happened. One was the sort of there was a negative reaction to these fun, to, to physics, fundamental physics. Uh, superconducting supercollider was uh, canceled. And there was sort of a generic attack, even within physics, on these questions. And there was almost this idea that uh, we know enough physics in terms of fundamental physics. You know, we don't need to do any more, which is, again, a ridiculous idea. Um, but also there, there arose this idea that um, physics was sort of finished in those terms. And the really interesting questions um, were going to be in biology in particular. So biology was going to be the science <clears throat> of the 21st century. And to some extent, that's true. Although already that has been eclipsed by all the hype and I don't know what else about um, artificial intelligence, computation, big data. It's already overtaken this idea that people were talking about in the 1990s about biology dominating science. And I reacted very strongly in the 90s to that, very again, because I had a arrogant physicist viewpoint that um, in order to understand biology and all the other complex systems, not just biology, but social systems and so forth, um, one really did need to have some of the um, culture and sort of technology of physics. And that was a very arrogant, narcissistic viewpoint. Uh, and it came from arrogance, which is, permeates a lot of physics, but it also came from ignorance. 
and uh, but I said it. But that actually got me into biology, because at some stage I felt I thought, you know, if I really believe that, if I really believe that physics plays a will play a crucial role, or at least the I the the. The, as I said, the culture of physics, the paradigm of physics, that is what I said earlier, principled, quantitative, calculable, predictive, and this iterative procedure of predictions, confronting theory, theory therefore adjusting if need be, and making more predictions and so on and so forth, which has been sort of the history of physics and to some extent the rest of science. Um, that needed to be much more part of biology and the other and social science. And um, I thought if I really believe that, you know, maybe I should put money where my mouth is. And uh, that's what got me into biology because I was quite depressed about the demise of the superconducting super collider and what looked like potentially the uh, demise of the whole field, uh, which hasn't happened fortunately. Um, uh, and I felt, well, let me start thinking about some biological problem. Maybe I can do something, even though I know no biology. Um, and the problem I focused on was um, initially was a personal one, and that was the, uh, the whole question of aging and mortality. And, and that came from something very personal, namely that I come from a family of short-lived males, meaning that you know, my grandfather died, my paternal grandfather died at, you know, 57, and my father at 61. And then my, you know, most of my uncles were dead before the, in their 60s. One or two, I come from a very large family, by the way, one or two made it into their early 70s. And so, you know, here was I in my 50s, well into my 50s. And I thought, wow, you know, if if it's if genetics is play, plays a major role, I don't have very long to live. I mean, maybe ten years. And uh, so uh, I started to wonder why is that? You know, what? Why in any case? Forget about me and my, you know, parents and uncles and so on. What about um, you know? Why is it that even if I went, you know? the most extreme case, I wouldn't live much more than 100 years anyway. So why is that? What in the health determines 100 years? And I thought, that's an interesting question. I'm sure biologists have solved it all and so on. But let me say, but actually, when I went to the library in those days, those days, I mean, even though this was the ninth, late 90s, even uh, mid 90s, there wasn't Google, well, there was Google, but it was so pretty, you know, you could just Google mortality and death and find all the literature. You had to go to the library still. So I spent time in the library and I discovered that it wasn't, um, that there was very little work on mortality. It was sort of a backwater, no longer the case, but then it was sort of a backwater and there wasn't really what a physicist would call a theory or a mechanistic theory of, of mortality. And no one, as I searched the literature, had even asked the question, why a hundred years? And that really blew my mind, which is very physicist viewpoint, not just asking them why, but putting a number to it. So why 100 years? And why not a 1,000 or a million or whatever? What determines that? Where, where is it? You know, and biologists had this very slick way of always saying, well, it's genetic genes. Well, so what? Well, that's not like, you know, that's like magic. You know, <laughs> how, do the, how do the genes know? I mean, there's another way of saying it. What, what is it? What is, I mean, because the genes operate at molecular time scales. What do they know about a century? You know, so, you know, what do molecules know about tens and hundreds or even thousands of years? So how does that happen? So that intrigued me. And so I started thinking about it. And to my, to my great surprise, uh, over the subsequent years, I sort of morphed into a kind of pseudo biologist for a while. And, uh, and, and that happened primarily because I was able to eventually understand some of these questions. Um, uh, and uh, because I eventually met um, an extremely good biologist 
who was a very well-known ecologist, Jim Brown, who, um, even though he was not trained in physics, sort of had a big picture physics outlook on ecology and biology. And the other thing that was very prominent, and now I'm really getting to answer your question, <laughs> eventually, is that I, um, in my ruminations uh, into the literature, in the biological literature, especially about mortality, but in general, um, I learned about all these incredible scaling laws, uh, which we can talk about in a little bit, maybe. But these extraordinary laws that biologists had actually discovered um, um, that sort of covered all of life. And there they were, and they're quantitative, they're mathematical, and there was no, no one had come up with a credible explanation for why there should be all these interconnected scaling laws. That's what stimulated me when I thought, my God, this is, this is begging to be solved and uh, um, maybe I can do something. And that's how I learned biology was through the scaling laws and attacking the problem. Well, we can talk about that as we go on as to what those are and what I try to do. That's very interesting. And not only do you tackle these scaling laws in uh, you know, one particular domain, you, you branch out and you go, these, that, uh, these laws that apply to animals or mammals apply to, to other animals. They also apply to plants. They also apply to cities and networks. And I found it really fascinating that all these were so interconnected. And a lot of the scaling laws and theories that you mentioned in your book, some of them have been around for hundreds of years. And yet this unified framework that you brought to the, the foreground, I think is, is I hadn't seen that before. I hadn't, I hadn't, I'd had no idea that trees had a similar structure to my, the vein, the veins and arteries in my body and, and the roads and highways in a city. It's just, it, it blew my mind. So I, I guess my first question is, why why did it take so long to understand that there's a there's connections between these theories across disciplines when some of the fundamental laws and fundamental theories have been around for so long yes that's a hard question to answer and it, it, and, it and it brings up many other questions um and it is an interesting question why all this wasn't done a long time ago and um, another example, so one of the things about this, let me just delve a teeny bit into the scaling laws and the theory behind them, just so that we set up the framework. And then I'll try to answer your question, because it's a really fascinating one. Um, you know, kind of the, the, the sociology in a certain sense, or the dynamics, the, the kind of the dynamics of why a lot of this wasn't done much earlier. Um, so let me just tell you, say for the audience, um, a scaling law is something very simple in principle. It just asks, you know, if you take an object or you take um, um, a class of objects, how do they scale relative to one another? So the, just stay with biology. Um, um, you know, if you take, you know, we have this concept of mammals, that is, there's a taxonomic group in which we all have similar kinds of physiology and the question is you know if you look at any physiological variable and the most fundamental of those being metabolic rate so how much energy how much food is needed per day to stay alive and you ask how does that change as i go from the smallest animal to the largest or from the smallest mammal in this case a shrew which sits on the palm of your hand up to a blue whale which is as big probably as the building you're in uh, uh, a factor of about 100 million, actually, in, in weight. Um, how does metabolic rate and all the uh, it's all the physiological variables change? You know, how does heart rate change? How does the length of its aorta change? How many, you know, how does the number of offspring it has change? Anything, anything you can think of. And um, it turns out when you plot these things, you plot the nut, whatever they're quantity is versus the size as measured by its weight and you plot it logarithmically this is very important logarithmically simply meaning that you go up by factors of 10 rather than one two three four you go up 
one, ten, a hundred, a thousand. So you get, in fact, the shrew and the whale on the same graph. Um, there's eight orders of magnitude, which you can't have a linear piece of paper. <laughs> I think in my book, I actually calculated how long it would be. I think it was something like a piece of paper. I forget. I, I'll make up a number: fifty or hundred kilometers long in order to get the, if you did it, you know, one, two, three, four, in terms of grams. Um, so you have to do it logarithmically for practical reasons. Um, there are also theoretical reasons for it. But um, uh, if you plot it that way, all of these variables, all of these characteristics, when you plot them just on straight lines, which is kind of extraordinary, because uh, here's the most, what is maybe the most complex dynamic, the complex system in the universe, well, as far as we know, it is. I mean, life is the most complex we know of. Um, presumably, there's life elsewhere. But as far as we know, this is it so far. And it's unbelievably complex. And, uh, and so, and not only that, we also believe it's evolved by natural selection, that is, evolutionary processes, you know, survival of the fittest, competition, and then natural selection leading to the organisms we see, and it's a continually, continually evolving process, um, that everything is just historically contingent. So every organism, every component of the organism, every organ, every cell type, every genome, has its own unique history. So you would have thought, and that's the way biology operates, that every organism is unique. Is you know it's totally unique. So if you plotted these, you expect tremendous spread across a piece of graph paper plotted logarithmically, um, uh, reflecting this kind of historical contingency um, explicit in the process of natural selection. That's not what you see at all. You see everything lined up. And in fact, I will say a very provocative statement: it's lined up as if it was designed. It would be like designing an aircraft or something. It's like, so that's not what we what we believe. There's not some great intelligent designer engineer up there in the sky, at least I don't believe so, <laughs> designing this. So how in the hell did this happen? So that was the problem. And um, that's the problem my, uh, I worked on and eventually solved in collaboration with Jim Brown, who I already mentioned, and his then student, Brian Enquist, who uh, is now himself a, a well-known ecologist, biologist at the University of Arizona, uh, we worked on. And um, the idea simply is that um, the one thing that is common to all organisms, whether they're microscopic or macroscopic, is first of all, they're made of enormous numbers of components. It's all these constituents and they have to be serviced both fed and sustained and so on um, in a roughly democratic efficient way and the way that has evolved is the obvious way networks you know we're a bunch of networks so you know we have a heart that delivers blood through the vascular system to your cells um, and within the cells, there are networks within the cells that deliver them to mitochondria within cells and so on and so forth. So you can imagine you have all these networks inside you from the cardiovascular system to your respiratory system to your neural system, which is information transmitting uh, your renal system, even your bones. They're all sort of networked systems. And so the idea was it is the kind of universal principles and the mathematics of these networks that is transcending the design and uh, the crucial part about these networks, one of the most crucial aspects of the networks that is postulated is that the process of natural selection, the process of competition, that continuous feedback that is honing the system as we compete both with other organisms and find our appropriate environmental niche has led towards a tendency towards optimizing the system. So the network, so just to give one example, our cardiovascular system, and by our, I mean every mammal that has ever existed, 
our cardiovascular system, which we all share, has evolved to be approximately optimal in terms of minimizing the amount of energy your heart has to do, amount of power it has to put out in order to pump blood through your that system to feed the cells, to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the cells. It minimizes that so as you so that you can maximize the amount of energy you devote to the to living and to most importantly to reproduction and the rearing of offspring which is called darwinian fitness which is the survival of the fittest so um it's it's a a, a sort of a an alternative if you like formulation of the survival of the fittest you want to minimize the amount of energy amount of metabolic energy that uh, you have to devote to the process of keeping you alive and living so that you can maximize the amount of energy you can devote to what would be hunting and gathering and rearing of children, having sex and having offspring and so on. So that's the idea. So it turns out that almost all of physics, in fact, all of physics in some way or another can be expressed in terms of optimization rules. So we as physicists, that's the way we often think about things, that you know the fundamental laws of nature all can be derived from optimizing something that we technically call action. We call it action, but that's, that, I'm not gonna bore the audience who what that is, but there's a technical quantity, mathematical quantity called action. And by maximizing, by optimizing it, we, it leads to, it depends on the system, but Schrodinger's equation for quantum mechanics or uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. But you can put them all into terms of this optimization. So it's very natural for a physicist to think in these terms. And, uh, and so that's the way I pushed it. And that's the way. Um, so now I want to go to your question. So that's the background of these scaling laws. And scaling itself this, this way of representing natural phenomena as, um, you know, how does a characteristic of the system change with the size of the system um, is, is integral to physics thinking. It's, um, it goes back, in fact, to Galileo. Galileo, who sort of founded modern science, already was thinking that by asking the question, why can't we have infinitely tall trees or buildings? And uh, he used a scaling law of, you know, what happens if you keep scaling up a tree or scaling up a building? Well, he argued very convincingly, powerfully, that the reason is that eventually it collapses under its own weight. And uh, I won't bore again, bore the audience with details of that. But, um, and um, it's, it sort of set a prototype um, that, that permeates um, certainly permeates physics, but in many ways permeates all of science and, of course, engineering in particular. Um, so it's, it's a subject, but it's, it's a curious subject, the whole subject of scale, because no one really teaches it. You know, there isn't, I don't know of a single course anywhere where it's taught. It's just taught as you go along. You know, I mean, it, it's by example, and people pick it up, and most, um, you know, um, hard scientists are very familiar with it as a technique. So, given that, it's quite surprising that, uh, you know, this, this kind of stuff wasn't already um, understood uh, much early on, or even that people didn't start thinking of organisms in terms of scale in this way. And that's primarily because biology evolved um, much more, instead of looking like physics does for the commonality among things, what are the things that, you know, make, you know, Newton's laws after all, was that maybe the most spectacular example in history, namely realizing that, um, you know, if you a ball rolling down an inclined plane, rolling down a hill or dropping a ball 
dropping an object to the ground actually is the same law at work there as the moon's encircling the earth or the earth circling the sun. I mean, that's, you know, we all sort of take it for granted, but it's kind of mind blowing. And it was mind blowing that, you know, that that's the same thing. It's hard to believe, but that was it. So physics has always looked for the things that, that um, are common across different scales and different systems. And biology, um, and you can easily imagine why. You just go for a walk in the forest or you look around at all the animals and all the insects and so on, and there are so many different things. You think, my God, everything is so different and unique and everybody is glued to their television or their videos watching National Geographic, how some animal does something very special and it's so brilliant and uh, you know, and all the rest of it. So you, what you are impressed by is the individuality of each organism that each one is very special and so biology became overwhelmingly the subject of individuality and diversity that everything the diversity of objects rather than the commonality and so it took a long time um, for biologists to start even thinking even those that had some kind of quantitative background to start thinking about, gee whiz, you know, we do know that there are all these mammals have similar, similar physiology. How's the metabolic rate of an elephant related to that of a giraffe or a mouse? And, you know, is there any relationship there? And it really didn't, I think the first person was not until the 1890s, but it wasn't but the thing that caught people's imagination wasn't until the 1930s when uh, this man named Max Kleiber, who I think had a physics background, actually, um, uh, discovered this scaling law for metabolic rate, one I just mentioned previously. And what he discovered was, of course, this amazing law that if you plot it logarithmically, just to repeat what I said, you see a straight line. But he also discovered the slope of that straight line had this weird number, three quarters, it was point seven, very close to 0.75. And what subsequently happened as people started looking at other physiological quantities, you know, which we could name 50 or 75, um, they all behaved in a similar way that I talked about earlier. But, and here's what I didn't mention earlier, and which was so powerful, for, especially for a physicist, the slopes of those graphs all were simple multiples of one quarter. So it was like, it was sort of staring people in the face. There's this extraordinary commonality, not just all the physiological variables of mammals, the, heart, the things I talked about, heart rates and lifespan and number of children and so on, diffusion of oxygen across membranes. All of these had these, what we call one quarter power, the slope being a multiple of one quarter. But so did insects and fish and birds and plants. So it was like, here was something that was, I mean, it was, it were, there it was. And there was a, some interest, some, a lot of interest. And some of the famous biologists, if it means anything to people like Huxley, and, and one of the great scientists, I believe, of the 20th century, J.B.S. Haldane, who was a remarkable man, Haldane um, and others got uh, very interested in it, but it was swamped. And here's just to complete this story. It was swamped by, in the uh, post-war period, in the 50s, by the, the discovery of DNA and the uh, realization of molecular dynamics underlying life that there was. And um, that sort of totally eclipsed all this kind of macroscopic stuff and the scaling laws. And it sort of went onto a, the back burner and then almost into a black hole. And uh, fortunately for me, not knowing any biology, in the early 80s, three or four people who had been interested in it, wrote sort of books, um, technical books, 
um, just summarizing all the scaling laws. And you can see behind me, my, I have some books there. And I think on a, if I move over, I think that bottom shelf has two or three of those books. And you can read those books. It tells you all these marvelous scaling laws. But it has no explanation. <laughs> I mean, they, there's, there's explanations for this and that and so on. But not sort of a grand explanation. How in the hell do all these things get connected this way? And and uh, the the insight that I and my colleagues brought to it was that the, the commonality that can explain this is this universal generic universal generic properties of the networks that sustain life. And you know, I'll just cut to the chase when you know the work that I did was to formulate that mathematically and show that these quartile scaling laws fall out naturally from the mathematics. It's, you know, it's, com it's, it's complicated. It's not, uh, and some of the calculations are a little bit challenging, but any decent mathematical physicist could have done them. Um, and, um, and certainly the mathematics for doing it has been known for, well, since the mid 19th century, certainly, certainly the end of the 19th century, and it could have been done any time, but no one did it, which is quite shocking. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Just a quick message from our sponsor, Stackwork. Stackwork is a lightning powered platform for generating high quality transcripts of all your audio or video content. They combine AI engines and hundreds of human workers all over the world who are paid over the lightning network to assemble these transcripts. And that's what lets Stackwork create better, faster, and less expensive transcripts. If you wanna learn more about Stackwork, visit stackwork.com. That is S-T-A-K work.com. One question I have is, what is the significance of the quarter in quarter power scaling? So you talk about how there's three quarters, sometimes it's uh, one and a quarter. The, the numbers seem to be related to four, and you touch on this in your book, but can you give listeners an understanding of why that quarter or the, the number four is so important here? So first of all, it comes out of the mathematics. Okay, so that's, you know, you set up this thing, you set up, you take these networks and you set up the flow in the networks and you then optimize the networks and you make some other very generic assumptions about it, which are transcend design. And then you get outdropped these quarter power, what's so-called quarter power scaling laws. So if you go and trace back where they come from, it turns out the number four, this may sound sort of slightly bizarre, is actually three plus one. <laughs> what I mean by that is the three represents the dimension of space we live in. Three, up, down, and sideways kind of thing. Now, how does that enter? That enters because one of the assumptions in deriving it mathematically is something that we call space filling. That is one of the aspects that everybody recognizes about your networks. They have to go everywhere. They have to service, every cell has to be serviced. So, so um, you know, a capillary in your circulatory system has to end within some very small distance of a cell so that uh, it can transform Trans, uh, it can um, transmit oxygen. So um, that's called space filling. And obviously that depends on the dimensionality. That's, you know, I mean, if we lived in six dimensions, it would be more complicated, but it would still fill the six dimensions and so on. So that's, that's one of the things. Now, the plus one is very interesting. Um, and that's to do with the so-called fractality of the system. So I don't know if your listeners are very familiar. Most people are somewhat familiar with the idea of a fractal. Uh, the other word that goes along with it is self-similar, uh, which is a much more descriptive term. And everybody is familiar with it. And most people growing up have been intrigued by it in one way or another. Namely, if you look at a tree and it branches out like, you know, goes from a big trunk to smaller branches and smaller and smaller and smaller, and it just keeps branching out. 
But what you realize is if you cut a branch somewhere up the tree and took it away and stuck it in the ground, uh, it, it would look like a small tree. <laughs> it would, you know, it would, no, no one would know that it isn't a little tree. But, you know, you, you could make it look as if it's just, um, you know, a, a young sapling almost. So, um, and in fact, it is. In fact, it is a small tree. And that's the point. The thing just repeats itself, keeps repeating itself, not in a simple way, in, in a non-linear way, in a way that is governed by the laws that the theory I described in deriving the one quarter predicts, predicts how that should happen and how to what, to, in other words, you could ask the question, if I cut a branch and I took it away from the tree, it looks like a tree, but how would I, how would it scale up to be the tree? Well, that's nonlinear and the mathematics I mentioned tells you how to make the scaling so that it is exactly, I mean, exactly, very close approximation to the original tree. So almost all these networks, all the networks inside you are like that. So circuit control is approximately like that. There's all kinds of caveats technically I would have to make, but in general, you, you are a self-similar fractal in terms of uh, almost all your net works and um so uh that uh now that has an interesting history too and that by the way that's called a fractal i mean that self-similar uh, phenomenon is called a fractal you see it around you see it in river systems you see it um you know in road systems and so on um, it's it's a it's a very common um kind of phenomenon and um, what is even more amazing, you would think that people would have developed an understanding of that, even the Greeks 2000 years ago, since they were interested in geometry, they formed the basis of mathematics. Um, but what is incredible is that no one noticed the extraordinary properties of these fractals until a man named Richardson at the beginning of the 20th century who was uh, realizing that about the, the, what's called the fractal nature of the coastlines of various countries. You know, if you look at the coastline, it has all this. Well, it turns out if you look at the way those jagged, you know, the coastline goes up and down and you look at the, um, the, that, that structure, it actually mathematically has the, the same structure as these kinds of fractals I talked about in networks. But it wasn't until maybe the 50s and 60s, when a mathematician named Benoit Mandelbrot put that into a precise mathematical framework. And that is kind of amazing because it, it permeates the world around us. And in fact, I've just told you that almost all biology is fractal-like. And it's kind of amazing that we did not begin to understand the role of fractals and self-similarity until at the earliest, the 1950s and into the 60s. And really, it didn't take off to the 70s and 80s. That is amazing. And we were completely dominated by Euclidean geometry, thinking in terms of Euclidean geometry. Everything is straight lines, and right angles and so forth. That's sort of the way, you know, I mean, just the postulates of Euclid, basically. Well, in fact, you know, the world around us, that was the point that Mandelbrot kept making. In fact, the world around us is not like that at all. It's mo almost all the Euclidean um, uh, geometry that you see around us is man-made. The natural world almost never uses Euclidean geometry. In fact, it uses fractal geometry. That's what we discovered. And, and it has its roots in these networks and the, and, and, and the claim of our work is the roots of those networks and the roots of the self-similarity is actually driven by the dynamics of natural selection. 
So it's a wonderful picture, actually. And it also sort of gives this insight into why it permeates everything. There's this, you know, if you have natural selection operating at multiple levels, then uh, these systems tend towards optimization and fractals lead to an optimization. Now, how does that translate into this four? Well, it turns out that one of the things that fractals do is they kind of add, uh, uh, and that's why they use the word, why Mandelbrot used the word fractal, because they add to ordinary dimensions, like, you know, we think of, as I say, up, down, and sideways, they one, two, three dimensions. It adds a fractional dimension, which is kind of a weird concept. You know, you think of a line as one dimensional, a surface as two dimensional, and, you know, um, a cube, say, as three dimensional. But these objects have, could have 3.2 dimensions. <laughs> and it's to do, it's all to do with the way these lines, like a coastline, scales when you try to scale up a, uh, if you would imagine uh, trying to scale up a coastline, that's the way they scale according to some fractal dimension. And the highest, so you can ask how big a fractal dimension could you have? So in general, you can only increase it by one. If you have, you know, if you're in a given dimension and you make something fractal-like in the way I describe, having this self-similar property, the maximal it can do is add one dimension, one added dimension. And that's basically what life has done. It has taken the three of, of space we live in and added a complete fractal dimension. And that is the ultimate optimization. It is tended towards trying to optimize this delivery of resources and information in the most efficient way. That's what it represents. That's fascinating. Now, the optimization of delivery of resources for biological systems also seems to be very similar to how cities design roads and, and optimize their resources. What, can you talk to me about the similarities and differences between biological systems and cities, which I guess can be described as biological systems in a way, but in another way, don't look like a biological system on the surface? Yes, this is a good segue into that. The um, uh, So... It, it, there's a long history, actually, of people using um, organisms as a metaphor for cities. Um, and it goes back a very long way, and people still do, and, um, and that's fine. Um, uh, but as you say, um, in some ways, it is like an organism because it metabolizes energy um, and its networks, um, et cetera, et cetera but also it's somewhat different. It's obviously does something different. And the work we got into clarified that. And uh, so at first you might think if it were, so if it were an organism, um, then it would, if it were a true organism, like the like, like biological organism, it would satisfy these three quarter power scaling, these quarter power scaling laws. Well, the first thing that we did as we moved into thinking about cities, um, was uh, with, with a different collaboration. I put together a different collaboration of uh, some very smart young people uh, who um, was to ask, do cities scale? Now, I already mentioned that I was very fortunate when I started thinking about uh, biology that there had already been written uh, two or three books that had summarized all these scaling laws. And in fact, People had been looking at scaling laws in biology ever since Kleiber made this discovery of the three quarters power scaling law for metabolic rate in the 30s. So quite a lot of work had been done. Cities, on the other hand, almost no work had been done. A little bit had been done, but almost none. So this was much more challenging. And uh, my young colleagues, not me, uh, uh, started to search the literature and by then, this was, when was this? The early 2000s, I guess. Um, 
Google has become Google <laughs> and you can get on the web and you can find this stuff. So um, even though it wasn't summarized in books, um, you could get access to data and they did. And um, we discovered, uh, again, to cut to the chase, that cities satisfy scaling laws, like, you know, mathematically looking like biology, meaning that if you plotted a characteristic of the city versus its size, and by size we took, size we took to be its population, if you plotted a characteristic, could be anything from the length of all its roads to how many patents it produces, whatever it was, they looked, they were straight lines. The only difference, there were two major differences, actually three in a way. One was there was much more variance. That is when you plotted these data points in biology, many of these graphs beautifully, they were very, there was just a little bit, you know, each, each we could talk about, this is a whole separate subject. Each organism, you know, deviates a teeny bit from the line. I mean, there's some variance as you go along. For cities, they deviate more. There's more variability, more variance. And you can sort of understand that because if you believe the theory that it is the process of natural selection, the feedbacks, feedback mechanisms implicit in natural selection, if that's at work that is tending organisms towards optimization and therefore towards lying on the scaling curve, on the scaling line, well, cities haven't been around very long. Biology has had hundreds of thousands to hundreds of millions, even billions of years to do this. Cities have had many of them at most the hundreds of years and a few couple of thousands of years. So it's been a much more, much slower, tedious process. So we weren't surprised to see more variants, but we were excited to see beautiful scaling laws. So that was so that in so it was quite similar to biology in that sense. However, there was one major difference. First of all, there was a similarity in terms of uh, characteristics of cities that you might think of as analogous to biological, like all the transportation and resource networks. They co obviously correspond to the kinds of things I was talking about in biology. You know, the roads and electrical lines and so on, the buildings, very physical, the physicality of the city, which is the way you normally think about the city as a physical object. <clears throat> all those scales like biology in that the slopes, and I didn't emphasize this, and, and I will emphasize it now in biology, what the three quarters in biology was less than one. Similarly here, the slope was less than one, but it wasn't 0.75, it was 0.85. We'll come to that in a minute. But one of the things I didn't emphasize was this less than one is very significant because it means that um, the bigger you are, um, the less energy is needed per cell or per gram of tissue to keep the organism alive. I mean, naively, you would have expected, if you go back to organisms, if you double the number of cells, you would need double the amount of food. But in fact, what that scaling law says is actually you only need roughly speaking 75% more. So you're sa every time you double, you're kind of saving 25%. So you're much more efficient. We are much more efficient than our dogs and cats, but our horses and elephants are more efficient than us in those terms <clears throat> uh, by a quantifiable predictive amount. So cities are like that. They have this economy of scale, the bigger the city, the less infrastructure is needed per capita. That's what these scaling laws said. But instead of a 25% saving with each doubling, you only have a 15% saving, which is very significant. And the thing that we discovered was that uh, in terms of the data we had access to, this was true uh, for cities across the globe. That is the, the scaling law for, um, I don't know, um, um, electrical lines as a function of size, the length of electrical lines in a city versus the size of the city was the same in Argentina as it was in the United States or well, Spain. 
and so on, or China. So that was very satisfying. So it was also had a universality word I haven't mentioned, but a kind of universal behavior that transcends the individual system. So uh, that was also very satisfying. But then we discovered something that um, came as a surprise to me anyway. And in retrospect, I'm embarrassed that it did. It shouldn't have come as a surprise. And that was that when you looked at any socioeconomic quantity, something that is not physical, but something that involves what a city is really for, that is the to enhance interaction among human beings, we found, we found scaling laws with the same mathematics, but instead of having this sublinear behavior, three quarters being less than one, or the 0.85 in terms of infrastructure being less than one, these were superlinear, bigger than one. The slopes were all congregated around 1.15. So this was new, and what and we call that superlinear. And what that means is instead of the bigger you are, the less you need per capita, economy of scale, the bigger you are, the more you have or need per capita. And when you think about it, that's exactly what you would expect. The bigger you are as a city per capita, you would expect higher wages, more ideas, therefore more patents, uh, more educational institutions, more uh, fancy restaurants, more patents, and whatever. All these things that are socioeconomic, but also more crime and more disease because there are more interactions upon people. Therefore, you can spread disease much faster. And uh, you can also spread ideas much faster. So they're quite similar, that kind of phenomenon. So that was also very exciting. But, um, and, uh, but, you know, and we found again that this superlinear 1.15, roughly speaking, was the same across the globe, whether it was in North America, um, Central and Latin America, China, Japan, Europe, and so on. And, and that was very, very interesting. So, um, so cities were more challenging than ironically, than biology, because it had these two things going on. It had it's kind of its biological part, which is its physicality, its infrastructure. But then it had this piece which doesn't manifest itself in biology, at least over very just kind of short time scales that we live in. And that is this socioeconomic stuff to do with the exchange of information between the citizens of a city. And of course, that brings up the whole question about what a city is for, because that's exactly what a city is for. The whole point of a city is to enhance social interaction in order to create ideas, to create wealth, um, in order to improve standards and quality of life. That's what cities have done. They're the most extraordinary machine we've invented. They've been extraordinarily successful. But Unfortunately, it comes along with not just the good, but also the bad and the ugly, namely crime and disease and pollution and so on. And uh, to the same degree, because it's produced by the same dynamic. That's what's so amazing. I mean, it's amazing that patents scale in the same way as crime. Well, they're both generated by interaction and they're both, you know, um, generated by uh, you know people trying to be smart <laughs> one good things one not not so good things um, so so um so that was very satisfying now we've tried to develop and we've been, had some limited success in developing a theory to, in the same way we did in biology to calculate these numbers and um, it's much more challenging because now there are two networks at role at, at, at play. One is the one that's I've said biological, the ones the obvious ones, the ones we see, the road networks, the electrical lines, the water lines, blah blah blah, the buildings. That's all. That's sort of like the biology. But then there's this kind of virtual one, which are the social networks that, of people interacting with each other, and those two are intimately connected. 
they're completely integrated and they're, uh, they work together, but they also are in tension between themselves. And um, so, uh, and, and that makes it much harder. But, um, and, and by the way, one of the things you can show, it's no accident that the 0.85 for the scaling of infrastructure is 15% below one, is a 15% economy of scale. But the superlinear is 15% above linearity of all the positive. And they, they're kind of compensating each other. And that represents that integration of those two networks. That's fascinating. And I, I think one other point you mentioned in the book is that uh, it, speaking about the evolution of cities and how there's, there's a wider variance of some of these numbers today, maybe because cities haven't gone through that same process that other biological systems have for as long, um, cities don't really die is another thing. And, and that I, I'd love to hear your take on why that is and what in, in the sense of like every biological system dies at some point. Why aren't cities experiencing that same, you know, birth and then death cycle that humans and animals and plants all do? Yes. I don't think I can answer that fully, but that was a question. One of the questions that, um, so when we did this work on, um, on cities, it was very natural to extend it to companies. So I'm going to extend your question first. And uh, one of the things, in fact, I thought companies would be more interesting, interesting than cities, but it turned out the other way around. It turns out cities are much more interesting than companies, uh, mostly because they're the essence of life and the essence of the long-term sustainability of the planet. Not that companies don't play an important role, but, but one of the things we quickly discovered and realized about companies is that um, companies die, in fact, we then did a, a serious analysis of mortality of companies and discovered that for US publicly traded companies, the expected lifespan is about 10 years, which is kind of mind blowing. You know, that you, you mean they're already on the stock exchange, but you can't expect to last more than about 10 years. Now, there are companies that go for, you know, 50, 100, even two or 300 years, a few big outliers, but, you know, it's very hard for companies. Um, so they're like us, they, they're, they have a finite lifespan. But cities, by and large, sort of keep going. I mean, as you say, so there. So what the question I ask is, why is that? What's, so my question was more, what's the difference between cities and companies, since they're both social organizations of people? Um, now, um, so let me address that first, and then I'll come back to people a little bit. But um, so there's, a, of course, a fundamental difference between cities and companies, and that is companies are, um, uh, you know, have a definite purpose. I mean, not that cities don't, but they're, they have an extremely, relative to cities, they have a very narrow purpose and a very narrow mission. And cities have grown organically. I mean, really like, bio, in, like biology in that sense. In that sense, they are biological. They've basically grown biologically, organically. And that's not true of most companies. Most companies not. And, and that gets reflected in their structures because companies are primarily top-down. They have, you know, CEOs and directors and then all the way down to the workers. And cities, and this is the great thing about cities, of course, they have an administration, they're mayors and things, but the great thing about a city and what makes a city great is that they just make sure the city works and that's what they're supposed to do and so on. And they open up cities for people to explore the space of ideas and the space of different ways of living and so on. So one of the, I mean, it's a horrible thing to say in a way, a great city has all kinds of weirdo people wandering the streets. I don't remember. Yeah, I do remember Toronto. I did see weird people there. I remember walking the streets, certainly New York. New York's the essence of that. You know, I mean, it's a shame that it's turned into homeless people. 
but you know, but you see crazy people. I, I have, I remember just a few years ago, uh, but maybe it was the last time I visited in New York. I was on Fifth Avenue. You know, there's all this traffic and people, and there was, there were, there was some fellow that was scantily dressed, and it was wasn't midwinter, but it was cold. It was autumn, and he was in the middle of Fifth Avenue with traffic going by. And he was singing and yelling and so on. And there were police around who were just totally ignoring him. And I thought, this is a truly great city because it's a lot. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm got tongue in, this is a cartoon. This is tongue in cheek. But it allows, it gives that feeling because what it does, it's, a, it's those people are representing, a, pushing the boundary of the possible. And the feeling that, I can go to New York, or I can go to Toronto, and I can put on my play. I can do this. I can form my company, I'm, or whatever. Or there's a much greater opportunity, job opportunity. There's the feeling of a vibrant city, and we, you know, we know we recognize it when we see it, and it gets reflected in the super linear behavior of a city. You know, you are the more per capita. The more interactions and so on. Um, and by the way, we tested this. One, you know, we're, we're scientists. We have a theory. We tested this because if that's true, if all of this buzz, opportunity, the more per capita, the bigger you are. Um, if we were to measure the number of interactions in a city, we could actually do it. Versus, and plot it versus city size, it should just behave like one of these socioeconomic metrics. It should also scale as 1.15 approximately, because all those metrics are reflecting that social interaction. Well, we were fortunate to team up with some colleagues at MIT who had access to billions and billions of phone call data, mobile phone data mostly. Um, in various countries um, and um, we were able to analyze those to measure as a proxy the interaction between people because by the time we had this data most people were carrying <laughs> this little detector so you knew who they were talking to where they were and how many times etc cetera, etc cetera. you know everything about you know everything actually and um, so uh, that was analyzed. And lo and behold, when you measured the interaction, by the way, the way we measured interaction was very trivial. If I call you, you call me back within six months, I think we took. Then I say, we have an interaction. And then we count those. Um, you could make it three months or a year. But it's, that's an arbit the threshold is arbitrary, obviously. And we changed, the, we changed it to see that it didn't make any difference. Um, and uh, when we plotted those, lo and behold, the number of social interactions scaled with 1.15 as predicted. And uh, that, was, that was very satisfying. Um, so um, going back now to the city as distinct from the company. So the city allows and, in, and uh, sort of, and, and in a certain sense facilitates and encourages social interaction and even I would say outliers. Company does exactly the opposite. It constrains interaction. This is how you're supposed to behave. This is what you have to do. And if you deviate, you're fired. Even Google, which tries to present this image that everybody's sort of a homeless MIT graduate student kind of image in the basement somewhere. Um, is not like that at all. I mean, they're quite, I mean, there is a little bit of it, but even there, you know, they have to, obviously the company has to run. I mean, the company has to produce, has to make a profit. So you have these huge controls. And, um, and so there's this complete difference in structure. Now, death, how does this transfer, transfer into life and death? 
well, when a company is formed, when you start first start, you know, you have an idea, you talk with your friends and a group get together and you have this kind of image in the back garage, either plotting some product or baking it or whatever, and you have great ideas, then you form a little company and you put it out there and you have this gradually, you know, you're brainstorming all the time and you have this sort of um, spectrum of products, artifacts that you're going to putting on the market. And of course, you have to you respond to market forces. Company, two or three of them sell tremendously. You know, you, um, and, uh, uh, and so you produce more and more of them. And these others, even the ones you think were the really smartest and the ones you really liked, no one's buying them. So buying, you let them go. So the company builds up company gets, you know, goes from 10 or 12 employees to 50 to 100 to 1,000, so build it. But at some stage along there, probably by the time you've reached even 20 or 30, you begin to realize you need a bureaucracy and an administration. Not only that, you need someone to sweep the floors, pick up stuff in the office. You can't do it any longer. <laughs> you actually need a structure and you start forming this structure. And people have to have jobs and they have to be here at eight o'clock in the morning and they can stay to five and you want some people to stay to late. And you start imposing this and then you realize you've got to do the tax returns. And uh, then you get notice from the federal government or the state government telling you there's a new law that you have to do this. Someone has to be there. So all these things start happening and the company turns from being I mean, again, a cartoon version, an idea factory into a bureaucracy and administration, which strangleholds the thing. And instead of it being dominated by ideas, especially if it's very successful, by the way, because when it's successful, you just go on producing that same thing. You go on producing Model T Fords and making them black <laughs> until someone realizes that you can actually make them colored. And you don't have to have them square boxes. Anyway, whatever. Um, so eventually what happens is that, you know, um, you may last a long time doing this, but eventually someone comes along with a different idea. Uh, external marketplace changes and um, you are now often sometimes too big that you can't change. Well, you can, but it takes you so much longer. You can't, uh, you know, you can't in two weeks change everything and start competing. And you get out-competed by the new guys that come along. So IBM goes effectively out. I mean, IBM, which dominated computing, no longer is a player. Can you believe that? I mean, especially me. I mean, my God, I lived through all of that. Or, you know, what happened to TWA or Pan Am, which dominated the airways? What happened to Sears Roebuck in the United States, et cetera, et cetera? So they cannot. It's extraordinarily difficult. And it's very hard to believe that there will be a time where there'll be no Microsoft or Google or Amazon. Because at the time, they seem invincible, totally invincible. And they're going to dominate the market and it's going to be like this forever. You can only be like that if you're a city. Because cities, because of this openness and things, are continually evolving and changing. And instead of the dimensionality narrowing, as is typical for companies, the dimensionality is always opening up. It's getting bigger and bigger. And you can, you can so as you mentioned in the, in the book, you, if you go to a city your um and, and as the city grows larger your wages exponential uh, super linearly grow your uh the patents in the city um and so i wonder and, and then you also mentioned that a lot of people are flooding to cities especially over the last two three hundred years basically all the world was not in a city up until 15 16 1700 and then now you have about half the world's population in a city and i wonder to myself uh can cities scale forever can they continue to grow and grow and grow and grow you mentioned at the beginning of your book that 
biological systems can't. And there's a few, few reasons. Like you can't have uh, a, an animal that just grows forever and just becomes an extremely large version of itself collapses under its own weight. And um, you mentioned the, uh, the, the uh, veins and blood vessels in your, in mammals bodies prevent mammals from being either smaller than a shrew or larger than a, a blue whale. And so I wonder what are those constraints like for cities? What is stopping a city from becoming billions or hundreds of billions of people? Right. So first of all, you're, first of all, just to repeat what you said that, uh, you know, it's kind of amazing to think that uh, 200 years ago, you know, only a few percent of the people lived in cities on the globe. I mean, even within, even within the United States, probably even less in Canada. Um, so, um, and now, um, you know, over 80%, over 80% of North America is urbanized. Um, and the world is moving towards that number. It passed the halfway mark, as you say, just a few years ago, and is moving towards um, this kind of 70 to 80 percent level. Um, and uh, and cities are growing. Now I, I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, the um, so there's nothing in the theory that we've developed, nothing you can see that stops an urban area continuing to grow. Um, now, what you call a city may not grow. So this is a subtle point. Because um, let's take Los Angeles, which has, which is dominated by the automobile. Um, it has even like 12 lane freeways. Could you imagine it? It's now I don't know, let's say it's 10 million people. Can you imagine it being 30 million like Tokyo or 50 million people? Well, it could just, let's just keep growing. But if that's to remain a city in the sense that, and here we have to define a city, it's all interconnected. Everybody's connected somehow with everybody else. If that were the case, you're all part of a network um, then you're going to have to make instead of 12 lane freeways, 24 lane freeways. And instead of, you know, four track railways, railroads, you're going to have 10 track. Well, you can't do it. I mean, in principle, you could, but you're not going to tear down Los Angeles. I mean, all the, you know, you can only do so much retrofitting and this you can't imagine doing. And you already see that happening. So what happens is even though the urbanization may continue, that what you should call the city, the sort of semi or autonomous parts remain, even though they're connected physically, they remain disconnected from each other. And you see that in cities. I'm sure you already see that in Toronto, that uh, there are parts that basically become, even though they're connected physically, they don't really interact with the city. Now, um, that's becoming more and more in some places. And it will become more and more. So it, it leads to some interesting conceptual questions. Um, but you know, um, you know, the East Coast of the United States is almost is sort of like a big urban area. But you know, Philadelphia is, I mean, Baltimore is different than from Washington, even though and they're not really connected, but and Fort Worth is different than Dallas. Um, and China, you know, that whole basin there has become one big urban area, but they are different. They do have set different characters and they behave differently. And the network remains, you know, they're two separate networks basically that, op that operate. So this requires much more thinking actually. Um, by the way, we've just myself and some men, some other people much more distinguished than I, in fact, one of your at Toronto, uh, Duranton, uh, at the University of Toronto is one of the co-authors of a paper that's just coming out next week in uh, Nature Cities. They've just got a new journal, Nature, but called Nature Cities. This is what, so what is a city? I think it's called. And we discuss these things. But it's a fascinating question and a very important question, both academically and practically. And it leads to, you know, what do we, what, what what do we mean by a city 
and how are we going to develop them into the future? One of the arguments that was made in your book about um, population growth was, well, you, you alluded to Malthus and talking about how some of his work had suggested that at a certain point, there wouldn't be enough resources to, to feed exponentially growing areas. Um, and I wonder if, I wonder what you think about how that squares up with the idea that cities are magnets for people, that they, they attract people who want to earn more money and meet more people and are, you know, concentrating further is, and, and I think for the, over the last 200 years or so, Malthus has been proven wrong in at least right away, but are some of those ideas still possible? Like the, the idea that we could at some point run out of resources to um, maintain a city, is that maybe a constraint on the size of a city? I'd love to explore, you know, Malthus, his views on, on whether or not uh, there's limitations to the growth of cities. Yeah. So this is the most interesting part of what we're talking about <laughs> for my, for me at the moment. This is what I'm most interested in is now at the moment, really. Um, first, I just want to have a caveat from what I said earlier um, about cities. The one unknown as we move into the future about this is the invention of what we're doing now, the internet, of course, that we're interacting now long distance. We don't have to be in close proximity. Um, in order to create ideas and do things on that. Well, I'll, I'll say I'll leave a question mark. Maybe we do. We don't know that. Um, I mean, I find because I'm old, it's impossible to work this way. I mean, I do Zoom calls and these Google calls or, you know, all the time. But, you know, you can't really do anything serious until you're in the same room with people and talking and making mistakes and so on. It's too anyway. But so there is a question as to whether the fact that we can work remotely, what is that going to do? And I, I don't want to get into that here. That's still a big open question. I mean, some people have the extreme view that that's the death of cities, which I think is ridiculous. I think it will not be. I think the cities will. I think the same dynamic is going to continue, frankly. Um, you know, so I'm, now let's move on to this question of growth, which is really what it's all about. So Malthus made the observation that um, with the coming of the Industrial Revolution, the discovery and exploitation of fossil fuels and the development of, of uh, capitalism and entrepreneurship led to exponential growth. And it's been extraordinary and enormously successful uh, for all its faults. And, um, uh, but he immediately noted that the, the supply of food can't keep up with it. And so um, the system will collapse or we may have to take draconian method, uh, method, methods and uh, limit birth and so on, which in those days would have been quite horrific, actually. And um, so that was very controversial and economists and others have dismissed it. He's been a no-no person forever. And as you say, he's proven wrong because he was wrong and he was wrong because he ignored innovation, the whole that we innovate and those innovations have kept up with the growth of population. In fact, they've stimulated population. It's been, it's not one thing or the other, they go together. So it turns out this theoretical framework, this framework that I've been talking about is ideally suited for trying to get to grips with this problem because um, if I go back to biology, I will just quickly say this, the sublinear behavior, that three quarters power of metabolic rate, which is what is driving everything, that's your input of energy, decreases with size. So the, as you grow, now in development from a baby up to an adult, as you grow, the amount being supplied per cell is decreasing with size. Your metabolic rate per unit mass or per cell is decreasing, but you're trying to add cells in a linear fashion and you can't keep up. So you stop growing. That's why you stop growing. Now, go to socioeconomic systems. You have the opposite. 
the bigger you are, the more you have per capita, the, the equivalent to metabolic rate, which I'll call the social metabolic rate, the analog to that, you're getting more the bigger you are. So the bigger you are, the more that you put into the system. So you grow faster and then you get more and you grow even faster. So you don't just get exponential growth, you get faster than exponential growth. And that's what we've seen. And you can, and that's great. And so the theory is very satisfying. You have this idea that you have the positive feedback in social interactions gives rise to superlinear scaling. But, and superlinear scaling gives rise to faster than exponential growth. And you see all of that. So that's re really nice and very satisfying. However, the mathematics gives rise to a real challenge. And that challenge is called a finite time singularity. Because what it says is that as the system grows, which is what we've seen, feeding back on itself all the time, um, it will lead to infinite number of patents, infinite GDP, infinite number of AIDS cases, infinite whatever in some finite time, which is obviously crazy, completely nuts, kind of infinite anything. Uh, and, but the theory tells you what happens. It says before then, what's going to happen is um, your, the system will collapse when you reach that singularity in a finite time. The finite time could be five years, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years. But in some finite time, you have to change something if you want to avoid collapse. So in that sense, it's like Malthus. Something, there's a limit to something. But the theory also tells you how to get out of it. It says, well, the point is that you've grown this way because you've been based on some major paradigm or some major innovation. You discovered bronze. That's why we say the Bronze Age or the Iron Age, or you discover, or you have the Industrial Revolution, coal, or computers, or the most recent one we're in, the internet, IT. And maybe we're moving into another one. Um, so it tells you what to do to avoid it. What it says is you're going up this curve, growing rapidly. If you kept going, you're going to collapse. But you, what you have to do is make a major innovation or a major paradigm shift, reinvent yourself so that you can start over again. So you grow, you invent computers. So you start growing again. You can sort of reset the clock. But you're going to hit another singularity. You better reset the clock again, make another innovation. And the history of innovation, major innovations, follows the predictions of this theory. And but so that's great. So that's what happened. That's how you avoid it. And that's why Malthus was wrong. And why people that have talked about the collapse in the past have been wrong. But what they um, the the one thing that, and so economists have said this forever, you know, said, you know, they ignore Malthus. Uh, we innovate ourselves out of it without knowing anything about it. I mean, they just say it like a mantra, um, uh, and it's, but it's been true, in fact. Um, however, this is a theory, mathematical theory. It's got a bunch of equations. It tells you what's, what's supposed to happen in this kind of model way. So, But one of the things it tells you is, yes, you can avoid collapse and have open-ended growth, but you, you pay a price. And the price is that the pace of life gets faster and faster. And you have to make these major innovations or paradigm shifts faster and faster at a roughly predictable rate. And that's exactly what we've been doing. Life has certainly gotten faster and we've had to make these shifts faster and faster. It is no accident that, you know, it took a long time for computers to evolve and it didn't take, it took much less time for com mainframe computers to evolve from simple adding machines, took a long time, then from those adding machines to electronic computer took much less time, but from an electronic computer to something sitting on your desk took less time. And then from that to the thing I have in front of me, this little laptop took even less time. 
and then for the internet to develop took even less time and now from the internet to develop to getting ai even and so on and that does it in that way and the question is can we go on doing that are we going to you know we're 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 going faster and faster so my concern is less about resources it's about time but time is a resource and we're running out of time and we can't keep up with it and not only that um, we're running out of the ability oh, and this is now a question are we running out of the ability to adapt fast enough to our own innovations i mean it's one of the things that i don't think we appreciate enough is how extraordinarily adaptable we have been that you know little old ladies and little old men like me can adapt to um, you know an iphone and i can do this with you but you know when we're going to have ai and chat gpt and self-driving cars and i don't know what life is going to get faster and are we going to have a socioeconomic heart attack because we can't keep up with the treadmill so that's my concern i know you have to go in just a minute but just one final follow up there uh is there a third way like is there i i hear these two options one is continue accelerating faster and faster innovations shorter and shorter time cycles and the other option seems to be some sort of collapse whether or not that plays out immediately or over time is there a third option is there a way in which we can kind of like stabilize and kind of like get back to a, a, a stable foundation where everyone feels comfortable and is not forcing everyone to continue to get, you know, faster and faster innovation cycles just to maintain life. Yeah, well, if I take this seriously, what I said, which of course moves into the speculative, I have to, I have to say, and I should have emphasized that, um, it, it, since the root of it is social interaction, I mean, that's what's been driving it. That means that you need a cultural change. You need some fundamental change, and um, you know, uh, and that's and the question. And so it's not that it's impossible. That is, you know, one of the things that I believe feeds into these social networks and into the the, the positive feedback is a form of greed. I don't mean, and that need not necessarily be pejorative i mean there is the fundamental greed everybody seems to want more money more material things and so on but you also want to run faster and do things better and so on and you consider that kind of a kind of greed i, I i'll use that word um, and that so it's it's got a sort of a a good side and a bad side to it um so maybe if we can minimize the bad and emphasize the good uh, we can adapt, but I don't, but my concern, so I think we could, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I, I mean, so enough. So the social change does happen. Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump is a fantastic example of it, that he got people to believe in a very short time that science doesn't matter, that there isn't such a thing as climate change, um, uh, and that you don't have to tell the truth, and so on. And these seem to be fundamental tenets of modern society. And within a year or two, he got uh, half of the US population anyway to believe otherwise, apparently. And that's pretty amazing. So that shows that some things can change quite quickly. Um, so maybe we can do that if we had someone that could have the same charisma as a Trump, for example, or a Martin Luther King or whoever, could somehow get people to be more modest about the, the negative side of their greed. Um, so this is kind of a, I mean, maybe I'm grabbing at straws here and it's a little bit uh, romantic to think one can do this, but that's what I see as the only way is some major fundamental change, which of course is what the green revolution where people were trying to do in some form. But, in a, but one of the things that seems to be true is that we need leadership to do it. That's the other thing that this points to, is that it's hard to see it happening from the grassroots up. I don't see the dynamic, maybe it would, but we need leadership and we don't have that leadership manifest at the moment anywhere in the world, as far as I can see. Quite the contrary. In fact, we see much more authoritarian rule arising 
And by the way, my speculation is that that authoritarian rule is a reaction to people feeling soulless and disconnected because of the increasing pace of life. They can't keep up and they feel completely, you know, that left behind, even successful people, that the thing is getting out, you know, it's out of hand. And what you need is someone like a Trump or whoever, a Modi in India says, enough, okay, don't believe these guys, just we're going to solve it all. It's very, life is simple. It's not complex, which is a completely misleading message and will lead to more problems. But anyway, that's more speculative on my part. It's, it's very interesting. Your book has opened up my mind to a lot of interesting questions and you've provided a lot of interesting answers both on this call and in the book. Uh, so I definitely recommend anyone listening to this pick up a copy of Scale. Jeffrey, thank you for the time. And uh, before you go, where can listeners go to learn more about you and your work? Well, they should read the book if they're interested. The book summarizes, you know, we've done lots more since then, but it's, uh, but the book pretty much says it. And, and I would say just that, I would say go to that. There's, I've given lots of talks and lots of other podcasts, but lots of talks, TED Talk kind of things and so on. Uh, some are more technical, some less so. But I think you can find everything you need from those. Um, you know, you can delve into the, the, the published papers, of course, but they're much they're technical for those that are, you know, te technically, pro technically proficient. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the ideas of what's important here, to tell you the truth. Um, and, uh, you know, I look forward to hearing from anybody that wants to, you know, ask questions. Thank you again for your time. And uh, thank you for writing this book. Well, Kevin, thank you. Yes. Thank you for asking me and uh, appreciate it.